All right, in this first unit of the course, looking at some of the classic arguments for the existence of God, and we'll be looking at some criticisms of those arguments. Continuing on with the cosmological argument for God's existence, let's take a look now at our selections from Samuel Clark's version of the cosmological argument. So we looked at one version of the cosmological argument in our selections from Aquinas last time. And Clark's version of the argument uh, is another version of what we called last time the argument from contingent, contingency. His presentation of the argument is somewhat different in its structure, but it's, it's basically the same idea. Here again last time we said that a contingent being is a being that could have not existed something that exists, something that came into existence, something that came into existence at a time, something that will go out of existence at a time is a contingent being. So as we said last time, this is a basic metaphysical distinction, the distinction between contingent things and necessary things. We saw that this d metaphysical distinction played an important role in Aquinas's version of the argument from contingency. There may be only one necessary being. If there were a necessary being, then that would be God, at least as, at least as Aquinas conceives of God, as Samuel Clark conceives of God. God is the necessary being. So. Let's take a look at Clark's version of the argument. One way that Clark explains this basic metaphysical proposition that there must be a necessary being is to think of it in terms of an analogy. Think of it in terms of an, an, an analogy with a chain. Suppose there were a chain hanging from the sky. Suppose you, you're walking along and you happen upon a chain hanging from the sky. And then suppose somebody else comes along. And suppose you're looking at the bottom link in the chain. And you point to this bottom link in the chain. And you ask the other person, what is that doing there? Why is this? Why is this? link of metal hanging here. A perfectly good answer to that question would be, well, it's there because it's suspended from the next link up. It's there because it's hanging from the next link up. That would be a perfectly good explanation for why that link is, is where it is. That would be a perfectly good explanation for that link in the chain. But of course, you could raise the same question about the next link in the chain, about the next link up. So you might well ask your interlocutor. You might well ask the other person, okay, well, why is that link there? Why is that link of a link of a chain there? And here again, a perfectly good explanation for that would be, well, it's there because it's suspended from the next link up. It's there because it's hanging from the next link up. Here again, that would be a fine explanation for another contingent thing. That is to say, why is this particular thing where it is, here and now, how did it? Why? Why is it here? That would be a perfectly fine explanation in terms of explaining some contingent thing, explaining some particular thing. But when it comes to the question, why is there a chain hanging from the sky? That form of explanation doesn't work, does it? That form of explanation can't work. The answer can't be, well, there's a chain hanging from the sky because of the next link up. That answer doesn't work for the more basic metaphysical question, does it? Why is there a chain hanging from the sky at all? The form of explanation that was a perfectly good explanation for any contingent thing, for any particular thing, doesn't work as an explanation for the more basic metaphysical fact. Why is there a chain hanging from the sky at all? That form of explanation won't work. Well, it's there because there's a chain hanging from the sky because of the next link up. That obviously doesn't work because you could just raise the same question about that link. So that doesn't really get you any closer to the answer to that question, does it? 
So if every link in the chain is dependent, what is the cause of the chain itself? That's the way Clark explains. That's one way that Clark explains his version of the cosmological argument. If every link in the causal chain is dependent, what is the cause of the chain itself? That is to say, for, for every particular thing in the universe, as we said last time, it's a basic metaphysical principle. It's a, it's a basic principle of all inquiry, not just in metaphysics, but in the natural sciences as well. It's a basic principle that for every effect there must be a cause. For every state of affairs in the universe there must be a reason why it is that way rather than some other way. The principle is sufficient reason. We touched on this basic, this fundamental philosophical principle, this philosophical rule for, rule for all thinking really. This axiom of thinking, the principle of sufficient reason, we touched on last time. For every particular thing in the universe that you can think of, that you can point to, it's contingent. It could have not existed. Now, from the fact that it could have not existed, there always then has to be a reason why it did come into existence. For every particular state of affairs in the universe, you can conceive of it as a kind of effect. And for every effect, there must be a cause. That's what the PSR says. That's what the principle of sufficient reason says, right? Every particular thing in the universe is contingent. It could have not existed. That goes for you and me. We could have not existed. It's not too hard to, it's not too hard to conceive of the possibility of us not existing because there was a time when we didn't exist. So if there was a time when we didn't exist, then obviously it's possible for us to have not existed. <clears throat> because there was a time when we didn't. And that goes for pretty much everything in the universe you can think of. It goes for everything, doesn't it? Planets, for any planet you can think of, there was a time when that planet didn't exist. Here again, the fact that it does exist now demands an explanation. There must be some cause that brought it into existence. So for every planet, any particular tree, that you see, right? There was a time when it didn't exist. And uh, of course, we see a lot of things go out of existence as well. So here again, everything in the world around us is contingent. We see things come into existence, go out of existence. We see it all the time. And even if we don't see that in every particular case, it seems like everything in the universe is like that. Everything in the universe is contingent. I've seen lots of things go out of existence. There was a time when the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Pittsburgh Steelers played in Three Rivers Stadium in downtown Pittsburgh. Well, Three Rivers Stadium isn't there anymore. I uh, had been there, but it isn't there anymore. It was demolished. Uh, there was a time when the San Francisco Giants played in Candlestick Park. Candlestick Park isn't there anymore. And of course, those things both came into existence uh, as well. Candlestick Park came into existence at a particular time, went out of existence at a particular time. Three Rivers Stadium came into existence at a particular time, went out of existence at a particular time. Those are contingent things. Now the Pirates play in PNC Park. I can remember when there was no PNC Park in downtown Pittsburgh. Now the Steelers play in Heinz, at Heinz Field. I can remember when there was no Heinz Field in downtown Pittsburgh. So, such as the way of the world, isn't it? Everything in the physical world around us is contingent, could have not existed. And here again, we contrasted contingency with necessity last time. A necessary being, if there is any necessary being, would be a being that could not have not existed. We just said that a contingent entity is something that could have not existed. A necessary being would be a being that could not have not existed. And because it could not have not existed, it has always existed. It, the necessary be, a necessary being would be an eternal being. And as we saw last time, this is how God is conceived by Aquinas in the 
argument from contingency, Aquinas' third version of the cosmological argument. And as I said last time, it's, it's an old idea, really. It goes, it goes back much further in the history of Western philosophy than just Aquinas. It goes back to Aristotle, the idea that there must be a necessary being as the ground of all contingent beings. So Clark presents the argument in terms of, of a causal chain. You think of a sequence of cause-effect connections in the world around us, whether it's things like planets coming into existence or galaxies or just particular things like trees or here again stadiums. For everything that you can think of, there's a causal chain that is that is related to it, a sequence of causes and effects. And for the causal chain, here again, just to extend Clark's initial analogy to the whole succession of cause-effect connections in the, in the universe, in the physical world around us. The same argument applies, right? For any particular state of affairs that you can look at, you can ask, well, what caused that to come about? Why is there the planet Saturn? Or why is there the Milky Way at all, right? For, for any particular thing that you could look at in the universe, you can always ask, what is the cause of that? What brought that into existence? And the answer is always some previous contingent thing. In the case of the Milky Way galaxy, it came out of a nebula. Uh, in the case of a particular planet, here again, there's a particular cause that you can point to that brought it into existence for any particular tree that you can point to. Here again, how did that come to be here? Well, it was brought into existence by the previous contingent thing. Maybe the previous contingent thing is uh, an acorn, say for example, and all the nutrients that go into changing uh, an acorn into a tree, something like that. The universe is a succession of cause-effect connections, isn't it? And with respect to every particular thing, you can ask, what is the cause of that? Well, the cause is always some previous, some antecedent contingent thing. But of course, with respect to that previous, that antecedent contingent thing, you can always ask the same question, well, what was the cause of that? So here again, this is a perfectly good form of explanation for any particular thing. Why is A here? Or what brought about A? Well, B. Okay, well, if B was the cause of A, what brought B into existence? Well, C. Okay, well, if C was the cause of B, what brought C into existence? Well, D. Here again, that form of explanation works perfectly fine for any particular effect. But that form of explanation here, again, can't work for the bigger metaphysical question, for the basic metaphysical question, why is there a succession of causes and effects in the first place? Why is there this succession of cause-effect connections that we, know, uh, that we know as the physical world, that we know as the universe around us? So that's the basic line of thought. Clark's method of argument is different in some respects from what we saw in Aquinas. He relies on a basic form of deductive inference known as disjunctive syllogism. So disjunctive syllogism is a, a basic form of deductive inference. There are two premises and then the conclusion of the inference or the conclusion of the argument. The first premise of a disjunctive syllogism is an either-or statement. Disjunction, either-or statement, these are just different terms for the same, same thing, same idea sometimes called a dilemma as well. An either-or statement is sometimes called a disjunction or a dilemma. Just an either-or statement. An either-or statement pre presents two possibilities, either P or Q, where P stands for just any state of affairs, Q stands for any state of affairs. Either P is the case or Q is the case. The second premise of a disjunctive syllogism goes on to further assert that actually the first of the two possibilities is not the case. Therefore, one infers 
in the conclusion that the second of the disjuncts, the second of the possibilities, must be the case. So either P or Q, not P, therefore Q. That is a basic form of deductive inference. And it's a form of argument that we find in Clark's presentation of the cosmological argument. So what would be a simple example of a disjunctive syllogism? Either an American League team won the World Series in 2006 or a National League team won the World Series in 2006. An American League team did not win the World Series in 2006. Therefore, conclusion, a National League team won the World Series in 2006. So this is a basic form of deductive inference. And in this case, if the, in the case, of, well, it would be true of any form of valid deductive inference that if the premises are true, the conclusion is necessarily true. So that is true with respect to any basic form of deductive argument. Disjunctive syllogism is a common form of deductive inference. If the premises are true, the conclusion is necessarily true. Oftentimes, we, d we don't know whether the premises are true. But as a matter of logic, every, it's true of every deductive form that any time the premises are true, the conclusion would be necessarily true. In the case of this argument, I can tell you that the premises are true. To see that that first premise is true is not hard. It might require you to know a little bit of background information. I suppose you have to know that there was a World Series played in 2006. And you have to know, I guess, that there has to be a winner. It's a best of seven series, the first team to win four games out, out of uh, possible seven games is, is the winner. And I guess you have to know that in the World Series, there's always one team from the American League and there's always one team from the National League. But given that background information, I think you'll agree that premise one presents a necessary truth. Either an American League team won or a National League team won. And then you may not know whether the American League team or National League team won in, in a, any particular year. So I'll just tell you that premise two is true as well. An American League team did not win the World Series in 2006. That is true because the American League team was the Detroit, Detroit Tigers and they lost to the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, the Cardinals won the World Series that year four games to one. So in the case of this example of disjunctive syllogism, there's a little bit of background information that you would have to know. But once you know that, you see that the first premise is necessarily true and then as a matter of fact, the second premise is true. So given the truth of the first two premises, you can see that the conclusion is necessarily true, isn't it? If those two premises are true, and they are, then that conclusion is necessarily true. So that's characteristic of deductive reasoning. And as we've seen, philosophers rely uh, a lot on deductive reasoning. All of the arguments that we saw in our selections from Aquinas, the first three versions of the cosmological argument that we looked at, all examples of deductive argumentation, deductive argument, and we see uh, the same in Samuel Clark. We see Sar Clark making a series of deductive inferences. Let's discuss a few of the further preliminary steps that Clark takes before actually presenting the argument, what I'm calling here preliminary steps of the cosmological argument in Clark's presentation of it. He says that something has existed from all eternity. Now, that claim, that metaphysical thesis, stems from a kind of, a kind of, a kind of, excuse me, disjunctive inference here again. Here again, I just gave a simple example of a disjunctive syllogism. It's any form of argument, either P or Q, P, not P, excuse me, therefore Q. In the premises, here again, you have a disjunctive statement. It's one premise. The other premise is the negation of one of the disjuncts. Therefore, the other disjunct necessarily is true, must be true. So here again, this was a simple example. When it comes to metaphysics, we get down to much more basic kinds of disjunctions, right? Look, either it is the case that the universe has a beginning in time, 
or it is not. Those are the only two possibilities, right? In the case of this simple kind of mundane example that I began with, as I said, you okay, you would have to know a little bit of background knowledge to know that P1 is a necessary truth, but given certain background facts, it's a necessary truth. When In metaphysics, we get down to some basic disjunctions where you just have to understand the concepts involved to see that the disjunction presents the only two possibilities, right? Either the universe has a beginning in time or it does not. Those are the only two possibilities. There are such states of affairs uh, in life, right? Either you're pregnant or you're not. Those are the only two possibilities. That's not an, exactly a metaphysical example, but just bring out the idea that certain disjunctive statements do, do present necessary truths. Either a body is, to use another metaphysical example, either a body is composed of infinitely many parts or it is not. Those are the only two possibilities. The totality of parts of which a body is composed is either infinite or it is not. Those are, those are the only two possibilities. If it is, then there would seem to be a paradox in our concept of body. Because an infinite succession of divisions and subdivisions cannot ever come to an end. So the parts from which the body is composed actually don't exist yet. So there seems to be a contradiction in saying that a body could be composed of infinitely many parts. But the other possibility seems to generate a contradiction as well. The other possibility is that a body is not composed of infinitely many parts. There are certain first parts that are not further divisible, but nothing material could be a first part. No part of a body could be a first part. I made this point last time with respect to the Eleatic argument about the impossibility of space, the unreality of space, right? That any region of space would be further divisible. Well, with respect to any body, any body occupies a region of space. So if there is no smallest region of space, there is no smallest region occupied by any body, which is to say there is no smallest body. Any body that you could present as a first part from which the larger body is composed, a kind of indivisible, must be further divisible because there is no smallest body. So there appears to be a contradiction in our concept of body. We'll get into this issue a little bit later in the course when we turn to phenomenalism, the view that the world is a mental phenomenon. The world is composed of ideas. This was the metaphysical view of the 18th century Irish philosopher George Berkeley, and we'll be getting into it in the next unit of the course. Berkeley and other philosophers believe that our concept of body contains a contradiction Therefore, the world is not composed of bodies, at least not bodies understood as material substances. Rather, the, the world is composed of psychological items, psychological entities, namely ideas. So, a bit of a digression here, but just to get across here again this idea that a disjunction in metaphysics oftentimes will present the only two possibilities. Either the universe has a beginning in time or it does not. Either a body is composed of infinitely many parts, or it is not. Those are the only two possibilities. So Clark says that something has existed from all eternity. Now, what justifies him in saying that? Well, there are only two possibilities. There isn't anything that has always existed. Or the other possibility is there is something that has always existed. As we're going to see when we get into Clark's version of the argument, the possibility that there isn't anything that always existed is actually not a possibility. From his point of view, the possibility is absurd. The, the thought is absurd. The hypothesis is, is absurd. It's not plausible, according to Clark, that there is not anything that has always existed. So we'll get into his reasons for thinking that in a moment. And he says in so many words that nothing comes from nothing. Nothing is created ex nihilo. Nothing comes into existence out of nothing. <clears throat> Maybe there was a time when the physical universe didn't exist. But 
that could not have come into existence where nothing at all existed before. So in Clark's way of thinking, <clears throat> there must be a being that has always existed, that brought into existence this contingent physical universe. Nothing comes into existence out of nothing. Nothing is created ex nihilo, to use this Latin term for out of nothing. Nothing can come to be out of nothing, where there was absolutely nothing before. <clears throat> Maybe there was no physical universe. Maybe there was a time when the universe did not exist. But it could not have come into existence if prior to that time there had been nothing at all. There must have been something to bring it into existence. If it was not some previous physical state of affairs, then it's an old inference in the history of philosophy that the explanation must be God, a necessary being, a being that has always existed. So, something has always existed. <clears throat> something has existed from all eternity. And whatever exists has a cause. So, we've touched on this principle before. That is the principle of sufficient reason. For every effect, there must be a cause. Or here again, to put it somewhat differently, for every state of affairs in the universe, there is a reason why it is that way rather than some other way. For every state of affairs in the universe, there is a reason why it is thus and so, rather than otherwise. That's an old principle. In so, the structure of the main argument is in the form of a disjunctive syllogism, either P or Q, not P. Well, in this case, the way that, in this case, the way that Clark presents the argument actually the form would be either P or Q, not Q, therefore P. He presents a disjunction. He says, either there has always existed some one unchangeable and independent being from which all other beings that are or ever were in the universe have received their original, or there has been an infinite succession of changeable and dependent beings produced one from the other in an endless progression without any original cause at all. Okay, that's a long statement, but what I want you to notice about it is that it's in the form of a disjunction. It's just a long either-or statement. And then what he goes on to say after that in so many words is not Q. Q is not a possibility. That is to say the second of the two disjuncts is not a possibility. It's an incoherent notion to think that there could be an infinite succession of dependent beings. So either P or Q, not Q, therefore P. I'm compressing what he actually says here for the sake of pointing out to you the basic logical structure of the argument. He presents this long disjunction. It's a long statement, obviously. It's so long that you're apt to lose sight of the basic logical form of it. So I just want to call your attention to the fact that the logical form of it is a disjunction, an either-or statement. The first disjunct is here again, there has always existed some one unchangeable and independent being from which all other beings that are or ever were in the universe have received their original. That's one possibility. The other possibility, although here again Clark goes on to argue that it's actually not a possibility, it's a hypothesis let's say, but it's a hypothesis that leads to a contradiction. The other hypothetical possibility would be there has been an infinite succession of changeable and dependent beings produced one from the other in an endless progression without any original cause at all. That's the other possibility, but actually that, that, can't, that can't be. Therefore, here again, the first of the two statements is necessarily true. There has always existed some one unchangeable and independent being from which all other beings that are or ever were in the universe have received their original, that is to say, God. So this is Clark's conception of God, the unchangeable, independent being from which all other beings receive their origin. This term original 
we don't really use it in that same sense uh, anymore. This is, of course, 18th century English. You, you tend to think of original as an adjective now, but in the sense in which Clark is using it, what he means is something more like what we would call the origin of something today. So those are the only two possibilities, logically speaking, but I guess you could say metaphysically speaking, the second statement is actually not a possibility. Why is the second statement not a possibility? Well, here again, an infinite succession of dependent beings would be like an infinitely long chain hanging from the sky. It can't be infinitely long there if because you, you, at some point you have to get to the first link from which it's hanging. If tracing backwards forever, you know, if, if tracing backwards from the previous link to the previous link if that could go on forever, then you never actually get to the chain. You never actually get to the link from which the whole thing is hanging, do you? So, by way of analogy here, an infinite succession of dependent beings really has no ground, has no basis, has nothing from which it's hanging, so to speak, has no foundation that explains why it's there at all. So an infinite succession of dependent beings is, is actually not a possibility. There, logically speaking, there are only two possibilities. An independent being or an infinite succession of dependent beings. But an infinite succession of dependent beings actually is not a possibility because there would be no explanation for why it's there at all. So an independent being is actually, logically, the only possibility. So God in this argument is conceived of as an independent being. Here again, I've used the term necessary. A necessary being is the term that we saw in Aquinas' version of the argument from contingency. Same idea. A necessary being, by definition, would be a being that does not depend for anything else on anything else, excuse me, for its existence. Here again, if it were necessary, then there would, there would be nothing for it to depend on. If it's a necessary being, then it's already existed. It's always existed. So in virtue of the fact that it's always existed, it doesn't depend on anything else to exist. That's just two different ways of saying the same thing, metaphysically speaking. So that's the basic structure of the argument, either P or Q. But Q is not possible. Therefore, P is necessarily the case. There necessarily is an independent and unchangeable being that is the origin of all other con of all the contingent things. So here again, why is the second of the two statements not possible? Well, Clark says if we consider such an infinite progression as one entire endless series of dependent beings, it is plain this whole series of beings can have no cause from without of its existence. And it is plain it can have no reason within itself for its existence. <clears throat> okay, so let's think about that for a moment. Here again, keep in mind the principle of sufficient reason. For everything, there must be a reason. For every state of affairs, there is a reason why it is thus and so rather than otherwise. For every, for every effect, there is a cause. So an infinite progression of dependent beings... Uh, a succession of dependent beings stretching backwards forever. That's not a possibility. There, here again, if we can, Clark says, if we consider such an infinite progression as an one entire endless series of dependent beings, it is plain this whole series can have no cause from without of its existence. Why can it have no cause from without? from outside of the chain, so to speak, because it has no beginning. If it has no beginning, then it has no cause. It's, you can just keep tracing your steps backwards forever. There is a kind of infinite regressive explanation, isn't there? Here again, why does this dependent thing exist? Well, because of the previous dependent thing. Okay, why does that contingent thing or that dependent thing exist? Because of the previous contingent thing. Okay, if that can go backwards forever, then the whole succession has no cause. Now that would violate the PSR. 
for it to have no cause, wouldn't it? But such a progression could not have any cause, or at least not any cause from without, as Clark puts it, because it has no beginning. So there's no cause from without because there's nothing, nothing outside of it, at least not in a temporal sense anyway. And it is plain it can have no reason within itself for its existence. Why is that? Because everything in the chain is itself contingent. Everything in the chain is dependent. So nothing in the chain, so to speak, no one, no one of the contingent things, no one of the, of the dependent things can be the cause for the whole chain because it's itself a dependent thing. It depends on something else. So you never actually get to the cause. So Q is not a possibility. There cannot have been an infinite succession of dependent beings. Not a possibility. Now, an old criticism of the cosmological argument is that there's a kind of composition fallacy involved. I touched on this point last time in connection with Aquinas' version of the cosmological argument, uh, in particular with respect to Aquinas' version of the argument from contingency, right? You know, sometimes an inference from parts to whole, everything in the, everything in the whole, every part has some property, therefore the whole must have this property. You know, sometimes that's a good inference, but as we saw last time, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a fallacious inference. And it's possible that the argument from contingency commits a kind of composition fallacy. We saw Aquinas say last time that everything in the universe is contingent. Therefore, the universe itself must be contingent. Therefore, there must be a necessary being that is something distinct from, external to, antecedent to the universe, namely God. And we see implicit in Clark's version of the argument a similar parts to whole inference. Clark says, where no part is necessary, it is manifest the whole cannot be necessary. So here again, just saying the same thing that we saw Aquinas say in, in different words. Everything in the universe is such that it is not necessary. Therefore, the whole thing cannot be necessary. Therefore, there must be a, there must be a necessary being, namely God, to explain why there is this not necessary entity, the physical universe. Well, is that a good inference? I gave an example of a, of, a, of a perfectly good composition inference last time. Every brick that I'm using is red, therefore the wall is going to be red. That would be a perfectly good inference. Sometimes, you know, if every part has some property, then the whole is going to have that property. On the other hand, every brick that I'm using weighs less than one pound, therefore the wall will the wall will weigh less than one pound. That obviously would not be a good inference. What explains the difference between those two cases? Well, there's no simple answer to that question. You have to, to determine whether a composition inference is a good one or a fallacious one, that is to say a kind of composition fallacy. You just do have to think carefully about the property under discussion. Is it the kind of property that you really can transfer from the parts to the whole. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. In the case of my example, color is a property that transfers from the parts to the whole, but weight is not a property that transfers from the parts to the whole. So you just have to think carefully, you have to think critically about the property under discussion in the argument. Is it the kind of property that really does carry over from the parts to the whole? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. You have to think critically about the way that the parts go together to compose the whole. That's one of the issues involved in assessing a parts to whole inference. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't really make a difference how the parts go together. The property of the parts is still going to carry over to the, is still going to carry over to the whole. But then sometimes it does. Sometimes it does make a difference how the parts go together. So here would be another example of a composition inference. Every thread in the shirt is easily torn. Therefore, the short shirt will be easily torn. 
that's not a good inference. That's not a good composition inference because that particular property doesn't carry over from the parts to the whole. You know, it may be true that an individual, an individual thread could be such that it's easily torn, but you take a lot of threads and weave them together in the right way, right? The result could be a fabric that actually is very hard to tear. So that would not be a good composition inference because the, the way that the parts go together to make the whole really makes a difference in that case. On the other hand, every, sh every thread in the shirt is made of silk, therefore the shirt is made of silk. That would be a good composition inference, right? Because in the case of that inference, it doesn't really make a difference. It doesn't make a difference how the parts go together. The whole is still going to have that property. In the case of the first example that I gave, it really does make a difference how the parts go together. The parts could go together in such a way that the whole doesn't have some property that the parts have. So composition inferences are, are tricky. You do have to think kind of carefully about them. Sometimes it's a good inference, sometimes it's not. What should we think about this composition fallacy that has to do with necessity and contingency? We saw Aquinas say, or say implicitly, everything in the universe is contingent, therefore the universe is contingent. And Clark here is saying the same thing, just in different words. Nothing in the universe is necessary, therefore the universe is not necessary. In both cases, the philosophers were positing some necessary being, some independent necessary being distinct from the universe itself. But with respect to this metaphysical property, contingency, is that something that carries over from the parts to the whole? Well, that's a much harder inference to evaluate than, than an inference about shirts or walls, isn't it? It's harder to say. This is a profound metaphysical question, and so you just do have to think carefully about this metaphysical property of contingency and whether that's something that carries over from the parts to the whole or not. That's something you'll have to decide for yourself. That's something you'll just have to critically think about for yourself. Okay, so on to the closing steps of Clark's version of the cosmological argument. The independent being is a necessary being. The material world cannot be the necessary being. So, why can't the material world, why can't the physical universe be the necessary being? And here again, we've, we've seen Clark already establish that there has to be a necessary being. So, the structure of the argument at this stage is there has to be a necessary being, but the universe itself cannot be the necessary being. Therefore, therefore God is the cause of the contingent universe, the contingent material world. The material world itself can't be the necessary being. Clark says, I'm paraphrasing, but in so many words he says, we can conceive of the non-existence of the material world without any contradiction. But on the other hand, trying to conceive the non-existence of a necessarily existent being is a contradiction. So we've seen that in both of these versions of the cosmological argument, or in the, I should say in these versions of the cosmological argument that we've, that we've been looking at, more than two, God is conceived of as a necessary being. Well, if something is a necessary being, and here again, historically, there's really only one candidate for that category, namely, namely God. Uh, that's an old idea in the, in the history of metaphysics. If God is a necessary being, and that seems to be a conceptual truth, we've seen that philosophers like Aquinas, philosophers like Clark believe it's a kind of conceptual truth. It's, it's just true by dint of definition that God is a necessary being. Anything that were a contingent being, a being that could have not existed, doesn't really satisfy the concept that one has in mind by God, the concept that a metaphysician employs when she's thinking about God is the concept of a necessary being. Not, it's not the concept of a contingent being. Anything that were contingent would not 
answer to the concept, would not fulfill the definition, you might say, that one is using when one thinks hypothetically, thinks conceptually about the, concept, the being God, thinks of what is involved in the concept of God. If it's a necessarily existent being by hypothesis, then there would seem to be a kind of contradiction in trying to conceive of the non-existence of a necessarily existent being. So it's an old idea in metaphysics that to deny the existence of God involves a kind of contradiction because the concept of God is the concept of a necessary being. And there is something contradictory in the thought of the non-existence of a necessarily existent being. So that's an old idea in metaphysics. Uh, we'll get into that train of thought. Well, we'll get into arguments for the existence, an argument, I should say, that for the existence of God that focuses more on this idea, this kind of conceptual truth about God, the ontological argument for God's existence will be the last of the classic arguments that we look at in this unit of the course. But we already see it come up in a, a, a partial way in Clark's presentation of the cosmological argument. Clark doesn't rest everything on this conceptual truth, as we've seen. He's talking about a lot of other metaphysical considerations as well. But there does seem to be something to that. You can conceive of the non-existence of the material world. You know, I started off making this point that with respect to every particular thing in the world, you can conceive of its non-existence. It's not hard to do because for a lot of things, there, there was a time when they didn't exist. For a lot of things, of course, we can remember when they did not exist. And we've seen a lot of things go out of existence. So you've seen a lot of things come into existence, go out of existence. And even if you haven't seen it yourself, you, you understand that there was a time when it didn't exist. So there was a time when the Statue of Liberty did not exist, say, for example. Uh, I can't remember the time when the Statue of Liberty did not exist, but I understand that there was a time when it did not exist. And then here again, in my lifetime, I, I have seen things come into existence that didn't exist before. Uh, PNC Park, where the Pittsburgh Pirates play now. I can remember when that didn't exist. Uh, Heinz Field, where the Pittsburgh Steelers play now. I can remember when that didn't exist. So, And even with respect to older things, like the Wall of China or the Statue of Liberty, um, we understand that there was a time when they did not exist. And when you just extend that thought to the whole material world, here again, you can see Clark's point, the whole physical universe, there, there doesn't seem to be any contradiction in trying to conceive the non-existence of it. That seems like a coherent state of affairs. It doesn't seem like there's any logical contradiction in saying I'm thinking about a time when the physical universe, when physical reality did not exist. Now there would be a contradiction in stipulating some kinds of things, right? If I were to say, I'm thinking right now of a round square, that would involve a contradiction. I can't really be thinking of a round square because I'm trying to think of something that actually cannot exist. But when it comes to the physical universe, when it comes to the material world, it doesn't seem like you're in that situation, does it? If you're conceiving of a time when the material world did not exist, there doesn't seem to be any contradiction in, in that thought, right? Here again, there would, there would be a contradiction in saying, I'm conceiving of a round square, say for example, here again, that would involve a contradiction. Or I'm conceiving of a four-sided triangle, something like that or I'm conceiving of a non-prime version of the number seven, something like that. I mean, there are states of affairs that do seem to entail a, a logical, a lot kind of logical impossibility, right? You can put the words together, but the words don't really refer to anything, do they? It doesn't seem like you're in that situation, right, when you try to conceive of the non-existence of the material world. 
there doesn't seem to be any logical contradiction. There doesn't seem to be any incoherence in saying that I'm conceiving of a time when the material world did not exist, or I'm conceiving of the possibility of the non-existence of the material world. That seems like a perfectly coherent, logically possible state of affairs. But there may be something to the idea that there's a kind of contradiction involved in saying I'm conceiving of the non-existence of a necessarily existent being. So that's an old idea in Western metaphysics. It's, it's an old idea in the history of philosophy. We'll see what some of the criticisms of that claim have been uh, a little bit later in this unit of the course when we turn to the ontological argument. So Clark has his finger on a big metaphysical question here, and it's it's an old idea. It's it's, it's an old question in metaphysics that is always prompted some philosophers to the inference that there must be an eternal being. And the question is, why is there anything rather than nothing? It seems like a logical possibility that there could have been nothing. But if there could have been nothing, then here again, PSR, principle of sufficient reason, there must be a reason why there is something rather than nothing. That's a profound metaphysical question, isn't it? Why is there anything rather than nothing? It seems like there could have been nothing seems like a logical possibility. It doesn't seem like there's any here, again, logical contradiction in conceiving of a time when there was nothing. But of course the problem with saying that, as, as we s said at the outset today, was that something cannot come from nothing. And there is something now. So from the fact that there is something now, there must have always been something, even though we can conceive of a time when there was nothing, when we, even though it seems like a logical possibility to conceive of simply nothing existing. Actually, the fact that there is something now means there could not have been a time when there was nothing. Maybe there was a time when there was not the physical universe, but the idea behind the cosmological argument is that there must be an eternal being that then brought the physical universe into existence, if it did come into existence at a time, and of course that being would be God. So why is there anything rather than nothing? That's a big metaphysical question. And according to Clark, the answer can only be a necessary being. An infinite chain of dependent beings, again, has no cause within itself because there's no first link in the chain. That is to say, no cause from within. And a cause outside the chain, if it is not necessary, could have not, exi not existed. But if it could have not existed, then there is no reason why it did. And the chain is, quote, as Clark says, caused by nothing, but caused by nothing is a contradiction. Here again, caused by nothing would violate the PSR. Caused by nothing would violate the principle of sufficient reason. For every effect, there must be a cause. For every state of affairs, there must be a reason why it is thus and so rather than otherwise. Okay, so to review Clark's argument, something has always existed. Whatever exists has a cause. Now, what exists is either an independent being or an infinite succession of dependent beings. But an infinite succession of dependent beings is a contradiction. Therefore, the independent being is a necessary being. And the necessary being answers to the concept of God. Here again in the history of Western philosophy, it's an old idea that God is a necessary being. It's an old idea that God is an independent being. The independent being is a necessary being, and a necessary being has always existed. Here again, necessary by way of contrast with contingent means could not have not existed. So if it could not have not existed, then it has always existed. There must be an eternal being, and it is the eternal being that explains why this contingent universe came into existence.